Hello, uh, my name is John Engel. I'm assistant professor of um, otolaryngology at the University of Rochester. I'm a laryngologist, so I specialize in voice disorders. Um, thank you so much to the National Spasmodic Dysphonia Association for um, allowing me to present to you. Um, I'd like to give an introduction to spasmodic dysphonia. Many of you are experts and, and you know more about this than most doctors, um, but maybe I'll be able to offer some information uh, that can be helpful um, to all of you, whether you are someone with spasmodic dysphonia or an ally or a researcher or someone who treats spasmodic dysphonia. Um, so let's go through an overview of um, what I'll be talking about. I want to kind of explain more clearly what spasmodic dysphonia is, um, what are the causes, we'll talk about types of spasmodic dysphonia, and I'll also kind of explain to you why it can be challenging to make the diagnosis. Um, also another key aspect of what I'll talk about is how vocal atrophy or a loss of muscle mass in the vocal cords can contribute to um, how spasmodic dysphonia is managed and how people may respond um, potentially negatively to Botox injections. Um, I'll also talk about some diagnostic dilemmas and then of course emphasize a team approach to diagnosis and treatment. So when you think about voice production, there's many different elements. It's not just simply about the larynx or the vocal cords. It's about the entire vocal tract. And I often like to compare the, um, you know, the pipe organ as a very interesting instrument that can make some comparisons to the voice. You have a blower source, which is you know, the blowers that drive the organ, and those are your lungs. You have a um, vibratory source, which is the, the reeds or the uh, openings on the pipes to allow vibration, which would be similar to your vocal cords. And then you have the resonating spaces, which are the various sized tubes, the, um, the room in which the pipe organ is heard. And so that would be compared to your, your mouth, your, the, your, no, your uh, nasal cavity, your throat, um, your tongue, your teeth, which can articulate the sound. And the keyboard, on a pipe organ allows you to do that. So once again, a blower source, a source of air power, a vibratory source, the level of the vocal cords, and then the articulators, which involve all the spaces and structures that shape and articulate sound and speech. Um, when you're understanding voice disorders, um, it's very important to distinguish articulation disorders from an actual problem at the level of the vocal cords. And when we talk about spasmodic dysphonia, the problem is occurring in the brain and at the level of the vocal cords. But oftentimes people can appear to have articulation problems or have breaks in their speech because of the breaks in sound. So you can see that all of the vocal tract is united in this way and you can have a downstream effect so if the vocal cords are breaking up speech or sound, vibratory sound, then kind of downstream from that in the mouth, the teeth, the lips, it can appear that speech is also broken because there's an absence of sound. Um, and just look at this console of the pipe organ, how complicated all the articulators of the organ sound can be. And it's equally very complex with our own speech and voice. Um, when you think of voice and speech production, um, especially voice production, you should think about kind of a, um, a continuum between all these structures. And the brain is directing all these functions, but the brain also receives sensory feedback from your vocal cords, from your soft palate called the vellum, from your mouth, um, and, from, and essentially your, your hearing function is a big part of this feedback loop because then your brain is able to modulate your voice based on what it hears. It's important to understand the difference between hoarseness or dysphonia and dysarthria, which is more of an articulation defect, which has to do with speech. And so oftentimes people with um, spasmodic dysphonia are thought to have 
primarily articulation disorders, but really the problem is occurring or beginning at the level of the true vocal folds. And so how spasmodic dysphonia affects the voice is it interrupts normal vocal cord vibration. And so in order to get optimal sound from the vocal folds, uh, the vocal folds need to be approximately one millimeter apart from each other as air flows through them. And it's the column of air that comes up your windpipe or your trachea that separates and blows the vocal cords open and then a suction force that will pull them back together. And so this is the vibratory cycle. And so it, you can imagine if the vocal cords were being pressed too tightly together, that that could cut off or inhibit the sound. Or if the vocal cords were being pulled too far apart, they would not vibrate or they would not vibrate well enough to get enough sound. So that is how spasmodic dysphonia affects the voice. It interrupts um, the approximation of the vocal cords either too tight or too far apart. So what is spasmodic dysphonia? It is classified as a neurological voice disorder and it is uh, within the realm of movement disorders. Um, we classify it as a focal dystonia of the larynx. And so dystonia is basically a neurological disorder where muscles have un, uh, unorganized or involuntary contraction. And um, if this is occurring, you can disrupt normal function. Now dystonia can affect large regions of the body, um, an arm, a leg, um, or it can be generalized and affect the entire body. But spasmodic dysphonia is different because it's isolated just to your voice box. So that's why it's called a focal dystonia. Another example of a focal dystonia would be um, a writer's cramp, which involves your hand. Another example of a focal dystonia would be an embouchure dystonia, which um, trumpet players and woodwind players can have with their lips. So that gives you an idea of what a focal dystonia is. What happens is muscle function is interrupted and you're unable to produce a steady voice sound. But you do have a downstream effect on the speech, on the articulators that we talked about because the sound source is interrupted. This condition is thought to originate in the basal ganglia of the brain, which is an important structure at the base of the brain. Um, so a lot of people often ask what causes spasmodic dysphonia? A lot of patients will ask me that, and largely it's unknown. And oftentimes when we take a patient history, we determine that um, a patient will tell us that it can begin after a stressful event, whether that be surgery, general anesthesia, a trauma, a medical illness, or stress. We typically see this condition to be more common in, in women versus men, usually begins after age 25. And there is pretty intensive research being done looking for genetic patterns um, for some people with the disease. And so you'll probably hear more in some of the other lectures about the genetic research being done about spasmodic dysphonia. So when you think about the basal ganglia, it's, it's basically uh, a center in the brain that controls muscle movement. And so if you look here on this image, it's this kind of blue structure at the bottom of the brain. And then you have the upper portions of the brain, the cortex, and that those areas have both the motor cortex, which controls muscles, and premotor areas that also are involved with, with um, muscle control. And so the primary function of the basal ganglia is to control and regulate the motor cortex and premotor areas so that voluntary movements can be performed smoothly. So if you're trying to perform um, a motor action such as you know, a smooth arm or hand movement smoothly, the basal ganglia helps do that. Um, what the basal ganglia does is it exerts uh, inhibition or kind of suppression on several motor systems um, uh, to become active. So basically with spasmodic dysphonia, the basal ganglia may be malfunctioning and this allows um, the vocal folds to contract forcefully. So instead of having a smooth motion, they can contract forcefully or spasm.
and that's either tightly together or pulling apart um, to create breathiness or a combination of both. So adductor spasmodic dysphonia involves the adductor muscles. Those are the muscles in the voice box that bring the vocal cords together for voice. And so with adductor spasmodic dysphonia, the voice is typically tight and strained or strangulated. And it's because the vocal cords are forcefully closing together and they can't have adequate vibrations. So the voice seems to be strangled tight or cut off. With abductor spasmodic dysphonia, the voice is breathy. Um, and the reason being is that the muscles that open the vocal cords for breathing are inappropriately contracting. So they're contracting hard and pulling the vocal cords open when they should be closer together for a good sounding clear voice. So abductor spasmodic dysphonia is a different type of spasmodic dysphonia. It's more rare where the vocal cords are, are being pulled apart. You can have mixed spasmodic dysphonia and that is where um, you have almost a tug of war between the muscles that are trying to close the vocal cords, the muscles that are trying to open the vocal cords. And when we look at, the, at a person that has mixed spasmodic dysphonia, we often see features of both. And, and this is more difficult to diagnose. So what makes spasmodic dysphonia difficult to diagnose? Well, there are some other voice conditions that can mimic spasmodic dysphonia. And so there's other people that present to our voice center with extremely strained voices. We call that muscle tension dysphonia. And that is where people are compensating or they're using a lot of muscles to produce voice. And I can kind of mimic that like this, where I'm talking very tight. And so there are people that don't have spasmodic dysphonia that develop that disorder. And oftentimes it can be confused with spasmodic dysphonia. So part of our job is to differentiate between the two. And sometimes that takes time, voice therapy, or seeing multiple uh, specialists. Um, you can have a prominent essential voice tremor. So a voice tremor is a rhythmic tremor in muscles, and it can overshadow spasmodic dysphonia. So when you analyze or you examine the voice, mostly you hear the tremor, but hiding underneath that tremor is spasmodic dysphonia. So uh, people with spasmodic dysphonia can also have tremor. Um, you can have speech changes from a stroke or another issue with, with articulation, um, problems with your teeth or your jaw. That can create um, kind of confusion in actually making the diagnosis of spasmodic dysphonia. Um, sometimes when ENT doctors or otolaryngologists look at the vocal cords in someone with spasmodic dysphonia, they may also find nodules or polyps. And sometimes doctors are confused and they'll say, oh, that is the cause of the voice disorder. But in reality, um, you know, that's just an accessory. And the main issue is the spasmodic dysphonia. Um, there can be people who come to the clinic and they're evaluated and, and doctors or, or, or nurses or other medical professionals can perceive them as just being anxious or stressed. And so, um, you know, people in the medical field are not always thinking about spasmodic dysphonia. And, and, and it's not uncommon to come across a doctor or a healthcare professional who's never heard of the disorder. So sometimes patients with spasmodic dysphonia are thought to have anxiety or thought to have um, a, a mental health disorder. And it's a big um, you know, misperception. And I think that's where education can help. Um, so let's talk about vocal atrophy and spasmodic dysphonia. I often refer to these as competing conditions. And it's because what happens with vocal atrophy is that um, the muscle in the vocal cords can deteriorate with age and with time. And there are some thoughts that maybe vocal atrophy is related to an old nerve injury in the past, or it's related to age or genetics. Um, we still need to learn more about vocal atrophy, but patients who have vocal atrophy already have a vocal cord closure issue. And it's because the muscles are skinny. Um, when the vocal cords come together, they don't close as well. 
And so one of the ways that we treat spasmodic dysphonia is with Botox and Botox weakens the muscles. But if the muscles are already weak or thin from atrophy, it can mean that um, your voice is more breathy. So you may get a longer period of breathy voice after a Botox injection than someone who does not have vocal atrophy because there's already a closure issue. And when you give Botox, it makes the closure issue worse. Um, there can also be um, you know, treatments for vocal tremor where we actually help the vocal cords close better. And so we can augment the vocal cords, add bulk to skinny vocal cords. And if we do that and help the closure, it actually is counterproductive and it makes spasmodic dysphonia worse. So these conditions are sometimes at odds with each other. And oftentimes to find a resolution is to use lighter, more precise doses of Botox um, in patients with vocal atrophy. So what does vocal atrophy look like? It basically appears to be bowing of the vocal folds. So instead of a straight line from those little kind of knobby areas that you see at the top of the vocal cords, that, which is actually the back of the voice box because we're looking um, you know, fr from above, but basically the, those kind of two areas that almost look like knobby knees of the vocal cords, that's called the vocal process. And then the vocal cords insert at the front, almost like the shape of a V. And you should technically have enough muscle to have a straight edge. But if the edge is not straight, if the edge looks like a curved line, that's typically consistent with vocal atrophy. And what you can see on the right hand side of the screen there is the vocal cords coming together but there's still a gap between them because the muscles are too skinny. And if you inject Botox to weaken the muscles, then you make that gap even bigger and you can make the voice extremely breathy. Okay, let's talk about diagnostic dilemmas. So what are the challenges that we as kind of voice experts and specialists come across? Um, and, and how can we combat those dilemmas? How do we make a precise diagnosis? Um, you know, I think one of the most important tools that speech pathologists and laryngologists have is audio perceptual assessment. What that means is using our trained ear to listen to uh, the voice, to listen to instrumental sentences that help us show whether or not someone might have a spasmodic dysphonia or essential tremor or another voice condition. Flexible laryngoscopy is very helpful because it can rule out other voice conditions. It can rule out um, other things that can cause voice issues. And so we have to look at the vocal folds. Um, I often find with many patients that actually going through a short course of voice therapy will be very helpful in, in kind of separating um, all the things that could be going on with someone's voice to really determine whether or not um, you know, there is spasmodic dysphonia. And so you can almost think if someone has a voice disorder, oftentimes they're straining, um, there could be tremor. And so all those things can make it difficult to diagnose the voice disorder. And by actually putting some, someone through voice therapy, we're taking away excessive tension and we often can discover the underlying voice condition. Um, stroboscopy is less helpful. And the problem is, is that we um, rely on a strobe light to look at vocal cord vibration. But with spasmodic dysphonia, the voice is often being broken up to the point to where the strobe light can't even track or show us the vibrations. And so the vibrations often appear irregular. Um, some people uh, use electromyography or EMG to help diagnose uh, spasmodic dysphonia. Um, I feel that EMG is actually more helpful with essential tremor, um, but you know, some clinicians will use EMG, others will not. What EMG is, is it's when a needle is inserted, inserted into a muscle and you basically um, read the electrical signals in the muscle and that can give you more information. Um, but I think really the trained ear and the trained eye are the most valuable. And, um, and next I'll kind of talk about the importance of a team, but I think a team approach to diagnosing spasmodic dysphonia is essential.
So when you work together as a team, um, it can consist of multiple specialties. Typically, um, a speech pathologist and an otolaryngologist or laryngologist all work together. Um, oftentimes, a neurologist, especially one that is a specialist in movement disorders, can be the most helpful. Um, patients who have a lot of tension in their neck, their shoulders, their back, that can create tension in a voice disorder, a physical therapist can be very helpful in alleviating that tension and helping us discover the underlying voice disorder. Um, local support groups are really helpful because patients diagnosed with spasmodic dysphonia can meet other people who have the condition and understand what their journey has been. And that's, that's very helpful to many patients. Um, also, the National Spasmodic Dysphonia Association is an incredible resource, both at these conferences, online, and through the organization of research support for this condition. Um, oftentimes we find social workers and psychologists can be helpful because patients who have had a long duration of time struggling with their voice, it often causes a lot of emotional and psychological distress. And as we begin to help patients and treat them and, and, and guide them on the course and the journey of treating the condition, um, a psychologist can be very helpful. Um, and really, I think that the model for treating patients should be patient-centered. Patients should um, kind of direct the therapy. Our tool is to give treatment options and patients to choose the options that fit their life best. And I think educating the public on the condition is important too, um, so that there can be a greater knowledge so that people can get a shorter duration of time from the onset of their symptoms to actually being diagnosed with the condition. So just to tell you a little bit about the University of Rochester Voice Center where I practice, um, we've been in, in existence for seven years. Um, I started the program seven years ago. We serve upstate, western New York and northern um, uh, Pennsylvania. There's two laryngologists, myself and Dr. Todd Schneider. We have six speech pathologists um, who all specialize in voice disorders, and we train a clinical fellow in speech pathology in voice every year. Um, we work closely with physical therapists that work a lot with our voice patients, clinical psychologists, and we have an excellent support, uh, support staff team. Um, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to present to you. And um, if you have any questions, uh, you know, you can find my email on the University of Rochester Medical Center website and feel free to send me an email. Thank you so much.